and welcome to our first session on day three of India Food Forum 2016, the five course spread of retail intelligence for the Indian food industry, encompassing knowledge, networking, business, and innovation. This session will focus on food trends, the changing tastes and palates of India. Over the next hour or so, our culinary experts will look at how the Indian palate has evolved over the years, the opportunity for taking Indian foods and tastes abroad, and the opportunities for bringing international cuisine to India. New recipes, how television media have influenced the constantly evolving Indian palate, and of course, how food cookery shows and reality shows on food-based themes have influenced the Indian consumer. We have three distinguished members and experts of the industry who will be here on stage to take us to the session. Making the lead presentations is Chef Sabya Sachi Gurai. He is mentor at Fabrica by Chef Sabi. He has been declared one of the best chefs of India and the award was pre presented by the, His Excellency the President of India. He's won the National Tourism Award 2011-2012. He's director, chef, and mentor of Olive Culinary Academy, and he's a cuisine specialist and mentor at Mealy India. A warm welcome to Chef Sabhisachi Gorai. Joining him is Chef Michael Swamy. He has over 20 years' experience with the Taj Mumbai, Bombay Brasserie in London, Noon Products UK, Kuwait Airways, and the British High Commission. His cooking has been praised by experts around the world, including His Royal Highness Prince Charles. He has been featured on Australian Broadcast and the Discovery Channel. He has designed and conceptualized the entire food content for the first two seasons of MasterChef India. Uh, he has been declared one of the top 50 chefs in India, and he's won the Gourmand Award at Paris in 2012 for his book, The East Indian Kitchen. Let's hear it for Chef Michael Swamy. Joining them is Chef Nilesh Lemai. He is a multiple award-winning, renowned culinary expert and food consultant, and he runs a wonderful organization called All About Cooking. Let's hear it for Chef Nilesh Lemai. And to make the lead presentation and take us through this, it's over to Chef Sabhisachi Gorai. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great uh, being here at the Images Forum. This is my uh, third year, and uh, I hope you all had a fantastic evening yesterday at the cocktails, uh, ate and drank, uh, and so ready for the last day. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to be joined by two uh, industry colleagues of mine and all of you here. Uh, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go through this uh, presentation of mine, and then um, I'm going to ask... Uh, uh, Michael to take it up uh, from me and uh, last would be Nilesh and uh, later on if there are any questions or something we can all answer it as a group so I'm going to quickly go through it as uh, fast as possible. Um, so the, the understanding uh, as you can um, see I'm talking about something that I feel is uh, uh, 2016 uh, some part of 2015 and now uh, we are looking at Families are changing, women are working, uh, longer hours at office, so uh, uh, food, uh, nourishment, and uh, eating healthy, a large part of it has uh, become convenience. Now, uh, when we talk about convenience food, we are obviously talking about uh, supermarkets, we are obviously talking about ready-to-eat uh, ready meals, uh, as in uh, either are they, um, RTEs and RTCs, frozen meals, uh, meals are... Uh, meal kits and stuff like that that's become like a trend uh, of 2015 and becoming increasingly popular and I'm assuming in 2016 it will become larger and larger as we go along. Um, as uh, we are also talking of uh, uh, re uh, ready meals, uh, the biggest thing that I've also noticed in 2015 is uh, uh, pre-cut products that uh, you can assemble and have a, a meal at home. Uh, as closer to a freshly made meal. So a lot of these things have come about and we can again go back and discuss this as uh, you know we have time later on for this question. Locally sourced. Uh, we're going to come to the organic separately but uh, locally sourced uh, something that is uh, become uh, not a trend but also because of uh, various rules and regulations that has been implemented also because to eat fresh 
uh, farm to fork, we've been talking about farm to fork, farm to fork, it's also uh, to do with something that is easily available, it is uh, fresh, uh, we realize that we can control what we are buying, where are they coming from, uh, provenance of ingredients and produce that uh, we can look at. So uh, locally source is becoming really the need of the R, uh, both in terms of uh, the the laws uh, that has been implemented in terms of imported ingredients into the food business, also uh, to buy fresh, eat fresh, uh, support our own farmers, uh, support um, own indigenous produce and you know ingredients. Uh, slow food. Now, last year has been a fantastic year for slow food, and uh, of course, the uh, Slow Food Indian chapter has been uh, established. And in uh, New Delhi now, we have established a chapter of. Uh, Chefs Alliance, which is called the Slow Food Chefs Alliance. I'm a very proud member of it. It's headed by Razdeep uh, from the ITC uh, uh, group. ITC, I think he's the head chef of ITC Saket. Uh, so Slow Food is, uh, we also happen to uh, host the uh, Terra Madre, which is the uh, indigenous uh, slow food movement uh, at, that happened at Shillong this year in the month of uh, November, I think. So it's been a fantastic year so far as Slow Food has been concerned. We have uh, had a brilliant uh, five-day conference in Silong, uh, exchanging ideas uh, from different parts of the world, people that had come down to talk about how Slow Food has affected uh, their lives, what are the opportunities of Slow Food, how you can eat better, how you can go back uh, to understand that uh, uh, things that uh, are, you know, let's say grandparents and great-grandparents in their uh, time, how they ate with uh, things uh, from around the, uh, the, the places that, or areas that they lived, which means their farms, which means the ponds, which means uh, indigenous uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, folklores, tribal stories, things that really connects you and binds you to who you are, uh, what you've grown up eating, uh, practices that you've learned from your uh, families, and uh, best practices that keep you healthy today. A large part of us living in the metro uh, metros uh, pretty much have lost connect connection or lost our roots or have uh, forgotten the roots primarily because we're so uh, caught up in our uh, fast-paced life or convenience life. So I thought it was very important also to talk about slow food post the convenience food part of it. Because these are all coming in together, isn't this all uh, part of our uh, life in today in 2016. It's more important to strike a balance between these things. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Should I just run through the presentation and then answer? Yeah, okay. But quickly, slow food is basically a movement. You've got to read it up. Uh, it started by a gentleman called uh, Mr. Carlo Petroni uh, from Italy. Uh, and it's now a worldwide movement. It's a, uh, there's a website, there's a Facebook chapter. We can talk about slow food uh, in, uh, in details. Uh, regional food uh, coming back. Now, uh, uh, I've mentioned a few names. And in this, uh, the most important name I've not mentioned is my own restaurant, which is uh, Lavash. But yes, here I've mentioned of uh, uh, restaurants or food that has made uh, a big mark in 2015, or rather 14 and 15. Uh, we've always spoken about international food. We've always spoken about Italian, uh, French, uh, Chinese. Uh, of course, Chinese is almost indigenous, as uh, you know, we have a huge Chinese population in India, especially in Calcutta. But all the other foreign cuisines have been coming to India, and we've been constantly talking about them, uh, creating restaurants, trying to sell food or concepts. Uh, but uh, somehow in the last two years, and I'm, I'm very proud to be saying this, that as a chef, I feel very proud that we have really worked upon our own cuisine, our own food. Uh, and when we say Indian food, India is so diverse, so many different uh, styles of cooking, so many indigenous communities, so many uh, uh, regional uh, flavors or cuisines that is there in this country. And slowly, a lot of this has also now traveled abroad. You would see fantastic Indian restaurants opening up, of course, Gagans is a big example. Everybody keeps talking about it all the time. But you know, there are restaurants that has opened up in Dubai last year, Indian restaurants that have opened up in uh, UK last year, which have 
had Indian chefs traveling from India, going abroad and opening restaurants, not the usual curry house that we keep talking about. So that's been a fantastic trend of Indian food. At the same time, I've been uh, part of devel uh, developing this concept called Soda Bottle Opener Walla, which is open in 2014, uh, which is the Bombay Rani Cafe. Potbilly, of course, is one of the finest uh, Bihari restaurants. Now they've opened at the Bihar Bhavan in New Delhi as well. So now even the state uh, governments are encouraging their own cuisines. Like we would have never thought of a uh, Bihari restaurant opening and then finally going back and opening it at Bihar Bhavan. It was always just Litti Chokha, but there is a fine cuisine, uh, very flavorful. Um, and it's, uh, it's not something that we have spoken in the past. So today we are very proud of who we are, where, which is the state we come from, what is uh, that we cook at home, and we're very happy to put it up in our, um, uh, in our plates and platters in a fine restaurant uh, and feel proud about it. Of course, you need to kind of work on your presentation, you need to go work on your portion sizes because food at home is very different than when it comes to commercial food. Uh, Lavash is, one, I must uh, uh, mention one line about Lavash, it's a restaurant that I've opened last year, it is open in uh, September in New Delhi at a very iconic old heritage house uh, next to Kutub Minar. Uh, I'm doing something which is um, uh, the Calcutta inspired Armenian food, so it's a very beautiful story of the Armenians coming into India in the 15th century, the first travelers or the first white people settling, um, a large part of the colony was in and around Calcutta. Uh, so this restaurant is inspired by it. So it has all the Armenian uh, classical dishes, but also has great flavors and textures of West Bengal, which means it has mustard, it has chili, it has fresh lime, it has uh, spices. So it's a beautiful confluence of a foreign cuisine settling down in India, like the, the like how we have the Bombay Rani or the Parsi food, or how we have the Goan food in Goa, which is the Portuguese confluence, or the Pondicherry uh, confluence, which is where you have Indian food, you know, inter marrying into French food and creating a beautiful trend. Of course, this Armenian uh, part of the story is not really spoken about, no, not too many people knows. So that was another uh, 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 part of my journey was as a proud uh, Bengali to kind of bring out a story which is indigenous and part of Bengal, then working on other cuisines. Because I have already done a lot of work on different cuisines, so I thought it was best I go back and do things from my own roots. Uh, travel and food. Uh, very interesting, we're constantly traveling worldwide. Uh, it's also very important that we travel within the country. We are constantly going international. But uh, over the last couple of years, I've also spent a lot of time going through small towns or different parts of India. Last year has, of course, been uh, discovering different parts of West Bengal in terms of all the interesting, uh, you know, uh, whether it is the influences that has been left or the cultures that has been forgotten, be it uh, bringing back the palm jaggery from the Sundarbans or uh, reviving a uh, culture of potters where we used to steam, uh, most of our dumplings were steamed in you know, mud potteries and things like that. So uh, a lot of it was international, you know, we traveled to Italy, we traveled to France to study uh, patisserie. I've lived in Australia for a while, learning meat butchery, meat fabrication, and now it's more about uh, using those, understanding the techniques or uh, the learning and uh, bringing it back home, using all the indigenous ideas, concepts, and creating something beautiful out of it. Okay, a lot of data, difficult to read. Uh, I'm going to just quickly, um, you know, about, this is pretty much a mix of everything that we have spoken so far. You can all read, right? That's all very visible and big. So I'm not uh, going to read through the whole thing, but it's pretty much uh, a combination of all the thoughts and ideas that we've been discussing so far. Uh, but I'm definitely going to talk about this part, the being more adventurous part, as in uh, we're becoming more experimental, we're becoming more adventurous. Uh, we've had uh, seen this whole trend of uh, for, um, uh, science and uh, uh, chemistry being used and this huge uh, talk of molecular gastronomy. Of course, a large part of the world has rejected it today, but there are different uh, you know, uh, efforts that has been made to make it more palatable. So it's not just the gimmick in the food, but yes, molecular gastronomy or other parts of uh, you know, uh, cooking with science or cooking with technology is becoming important, and that is a modern uh, direction. So. Um, it's like any other modern method of uh, improving anything or bringing into technology into uh, our life. So uh, the best part is today the, uh, the audience or today the, the guests who are coming to your restaurants are more willing to experiment. I didn't think it was um, that big a trend, but over the last one year I have I've seen strong concepts that has come up and people have done very well. So obviously there's a huge 
uh, market for that in India, be it a younger population who wants to go out and try, or whichever way, but you definitely are finding takers for such concepts. Uh, organic, maybe just one quick uh, you know, uh, thought on organic food, because we've been talking organic, organic, organic all the time. Uh, but one needs to understand and have the sensibility to understand that what organic food is, how it affects our life, what do you source them from, how do you grow them. So there's a whole uh, big topic, so I'm not going to get into it, but since it is a part of my slide, so yes, that's also a very, very big talk that has happened over the last couple of years. And I'm assuming this year it's only going to get bigger, better, and we would uh, probably spend a little more time to understand what organic is all about. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, what I had uh, in this uh, quick uh, brief presentation. And if anybody has any questions, I, I, I assume uh, you have wanted to speak of uh, slow food for a while. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free. Uh, or else I'm going to pass on the mic to Michael for this. Uh, so quickly, sir, uh, if you, uh, what w was your question on slow food? No, I can't hear you. Okay, uh, so uh, primarily it started as a movement by, like I mentioned, uh, Mr. Carlo Petroni in uh, Italy. Uh, it was about against everything against fast food. So, which meant uh, you don't eat processed food, you don't support processed food, you don't eat fast food, you go back to eating food that is indigenous to you. A support food that is indigenous to you, which means uh, uh, you work with your local farmers, you grow ingredients yourself, terrace garden. So there are multiple things that slow food has, but primarily it is all about going back to your roots and eating fresh, uh, healthy food, which is handmade and not processed. So that's pretty much the whole movement of slow food, but there are multiple angles to it. But yes, in nutshell, stay away from processed food. Any other thoughts? And yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good Pleasure morning. to hear from you again. Uh, my question is, uh, there is a paradox between eating indigenous and eating weird, all kinds of combinations of the modern food eating habits. Right. So as a chef, how do you balance that? There, there, there are restaurants which talk about traditional foods typically, and there are restaurants which talk about these modern, uh, fancified, weird food stuff. So there is a paradox and there is a gap also. So as a chef, how do you balance that out? Look, um, uh, as in, it's a, it's a responsibility today to become a chef because, you know, you pretty, uh, people are looking at you, people are coming to your restaurants to eat. So I think a uh, large part of it is uh, to understand the responsibility and then, of course, the business part of it. So one needs to strike a balance. Because a lot of it, the decision of whatever you just mentioned is driven by business. Because we're all in the business, everybody needs to make money. So if you have a weird concept or a weird trend, let's say, or let's say innovative, weird is a negative word, uh, you will want to make money out of it, right? So you want to go out and experiment that concept in your restaurant, be it a food style, be it a cooking method, be it a, a story of the restaurant, be it presentation, whatever. We're seeing different, different things that has been tried. So like I rightly, uh, you know, I rightly feel that uh, it is a lot driven by the economics of the business. At the same time, as chefs, we have the responsibility not to feed you anything bad, not to sh uh, give you something that is not hygienic or clean, not to give you anything that makes you fall sick, not to give you something that uh, does not have nutrition. So uh, that's a responsibility that the chef's community needs to take. And uh, more and more increasingly, like uh, slow food is one of the reasons why I spoke about slow food, that m increasingly chefs are becoming aware of this responsibility that they have been entrusted with. And I have uh, two very uh, talented uh, you know, colleagues of mine who I'm sure will come back and reiterate the same thing. So to answer your question, I feel it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility that we all take and understand. And um, as senior chefs of the industry, we're also trying to pass it on to a lot of our younger colleagues. Uh, we keep talking in colleges and students. Grooming is a large part of it. Training is a large part of it. Education is a large part of it. So yes, there will be things like that. Sporadic attempts will happen. But uh, sooner or later, I think it will even out on its own. Thank you. Any, any other thoughts, anybody? or? Uh, Michael, you want to jump in? No, I think, uh, oh, we wait. OK. Yeah, so uh, you have a restaurant named Soda Bottle. Uh, no, what is that Soda Bottle, basically? No, it actually is a restaurant co uh, concept that is owned by the Olive Group. I was the culinary director for the company, and that's okay. one of the concepts that I had developed. It is uh, basically serving uh, Bombay Irani uh, Cafe. 
So it's like, okay. like you had the combination of the chais and the bun maskas and the berry pulao. So this uh, is the same thing done in a new uh, shell. Means, okay. uh, the, and we've used a f uh, funny name like soda bottle opener wala because okay, okay. you know we've always had funny names of Parsi family. So okay, mm -hmm. because I got uh, so as you're saying that you're doing away completely with processed food. So soda is something which is processed. So, no, I so just it's just a name. It's just, just like you know, you have bottle wala and stuff okay. like that. Uh, okay. But soda bottle is nothing to do with slow food. Soda bottle is a concept restaurant, and so th in one of the slides I spoke about new concepts. Okay. Uh, which is where I spoke about lavash, which is where I spoke about pot belly, which is where I spoke about soda. At this another slide, I was talking about uh, slow food. So these are all different, different trends basically. Okay. So uh, bringing back regional food is a trend, and that part of that trend is soda, lavash, pot belly. Also going back to a roots and working with slow food is another trend. So like I said, you've got to find a balance of all of this. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Michael, you're on. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael. And you will forgive me for looking at the laptop every once in a while because as Chef Sabi knows, I'm, I do often say something controversial and <laughs> then everybody's up in arms against me. Okay, uh, a few lines about myself. Yes, I'm a chef, a food stylist, and a writer. And my food journey has been a long and adventurous one. From the kitchens of London, Bombay Brasserie in London, to Kuwait Airways in Kuwait, and then doing a host of restaurants in Bombay, I've witnessed change, I've witnessed trends, I've witnessed uh, restaurateurs saying, why don't you copy this trend or copy that trend? And there are times when I say, why should we copy a trend? Why don't we create our own trends and move on with it? The past two decades of my food journey and travel has been through parts of India where places which one rarely sees the chance to walk into somebody's house and say, how do you cook over the, the mud fire? I've seen brass vessels a small vessel as small as this is probably about five kilos in weight. And one might ask oneself, why would I cook in that vessel? Those trends have died out. They are coming back in some way or the other. Why are they coming out? Because we have forgotten the past where cooking in certain metal vessels are healthy to our bodies. That trend has died out with the use of aluminum things like that. The trend of cooking back in French vessels, which are cast iron vessels. Um, Le Creuset, uh, I don't know, there are other, other couple of brands. But these trends are fast coming back into the restaurant world. Why do we say that we are going back to certain trends is where industry meets what the chef needs. The chef then partakes his needs to the client or the customer. When I was doing MasterChef, which was a short journey in my life, a couple of years ago, we did season one and season two. And this is where television and media plays a big part in making trends, the big, um, well, I would, I, should I say the big box industry, where we trade, where we make a trend into a product. How do you make a trend into a product? is when you portray it to various forms of media, be it radio, be it television, be it the newspapers. Our simple and one task on MasterChef was, how do we put Indian food to the general public? It was very simple. We took away the taste, we brought in the visual. Clean plating, white plates, uh, using ethnic cooking ware, things like that. I'm just going back to my nose for a few seconds. Um, so on MasterChef, we capitalized on a trend of a new food show coming into the country. But we took it beyond that. We didn't just portray uh, continental cuisine. The aim was Indian cuisine. And so it was in, the whole thing was an adventure for me and my team. I had a big team over there, uh, Mukda, who is here, I had another young boy, Ganesh, and he learned, he, not, he, he was a spot boy, and he taught me a lot about uh, the TV world. 
I mean, I was a chef learning from a spot boy about queuing, about making sure the food was on time, making sure the sets look good, making sure the food look good. And that's how MasterChef Australia has been a huge success. The flavors on the palate and one senses have seen changes over the past two decades. We are seeing foreign companies, foreign restaurants, foreign brands coming into the market. But what do we do with that? I was having a chat with Nature's Basket the other day and saying, you know, we are, we are having zucchini coming into the market. We've got fancy mushrooms coming like ikoni, inoki, sorry, inoki, and a lot of the exotic coming in. But is the exotic only limited to food hall and nature's basket? 90% of the Indian public don't know what to do with it. We've got to educate them. Where does that trend take? This is here where the trend changes into a product again. It's we chefs who have to educate the public. It's we chefs who have to take the step forward and say, enough, give us a chance to speak out. Chef, Spag uh, Chef Sabi is very vocal. He goes out, he talks, and I love the way he talks because I am so proud that there are a few chefs taking that step forward, going beyond the kitchen, and saying what has to be said. I hope, Chef Sabi, I haven't said anything controversial as yet. <laughs> are you praising me or are you abusing me? <laughs> I am very much praising you and very proud of you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. I'm going to take this one step further. I was at a very fancy restaurant in Delhi a couple of weeks ago. I left that very fancy restaurant not satisfied. I was at Chef Sabi's restaurant also during that same week and I probably paid quarter of that bill that I paid at the fancy restaurant. And my colleagues will, tell, will vouch for it that Chef, you have not eaten so much in a long time. I left that restaurant full and absolutely happy. Thanks, so, Michael. I should hire you for my marketing. <laughs> <laughs> but Can't afford you as a chef, but definitely for marketing. Absolutely. But the thing is, where I'm going back to is, again, to the next latest trend that is happening in the country today. It is going back to our roots. It is going back to our home cooking, home style cooking. But how do you go back to this home style cooking? It's only when you do years of research, years of travel. You can't do it in 100 days. It takes a good five years, 10 years. 10 years to build a brand, 10 years to build a trend into a product. Um, a young lady in the front just spoke about molecular. And in Europe, molecular is passe. It died out more than five years ago. Yet we are flogging it over here. Why do I say it's bad? Because we are moving from the very genetics of food. We are moving into a zone of chemicals. The guys who created have moved on. We need to give people substance. People are paying for what, they are, for what we are feeding them. So again, as a chef, it is our responsibility to give people what they are paying for. Um, I'd like to say something to big brands, because big brands tend to stay in the city. They are not moving out of the big city. They need to move out of the big city via a way of technology, that is media, moving the trends to smaller towns, to the two-tier cities, to the three-tier cities. That's where 75% of the public is. I was at a friend's house the other day, and I had these baby caps come with me, and we were shooting them. And they had a visitor from Nasik in the house. And the visitor says, oh, mom, she's talking to her mom and saying, you know, in, in, uh, these are, meant for display in, in the malls that they go to. People in Nasik don't know what to do with the capsicum or the colored capsicum. It's sad because it's a beautiful trend of having exotic ingredients. These have to be diluted down to the three-tier cities. 
and that can only be done with education and big brands taking that step forward. Chef Nilesh, over to you. Thank you, uh, Michael. And Sabi was a very good uh, outlook on uh, the trends uh, happening today. Good afternoon. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is, I'm Chef Nilesh Limai. Is this, are you really feeling, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, are you feeling cold and hungry? Okay. <laughs> because uh, we're talking about food now, so I'm sure you're going to feel hungry afterwards. And uh, though there's a good lunch spread for us, but uh, it's not only about eating, but I feel nowadays uh, food has become the biggest industry today. It's, uh, I think, overtaking even the entertainment industry. You can look at the kind of restaurants opening across the globe. You can see the kind of people looking for food. My son, who's just like 13 years old, already has demands on what he wants to eat today and what I should give him in the lunchbox. So uh, the trends are really happening. The younger generation is also getting to know uh, about what food is all about. They know what they want. They know the different uh, difference between uh, herbs and continental food and Western and Indian food. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, are you uh, do you have the same experience with you all? I would like to have a little interaction with you all so that I know we are on the same page. Uh, do you think that that's happening at your house also? Do you, make, uh, do you think in the morning that wh where you should go for dinner? Or do you think at, uh, in the evening that uh, what you should have for breakfast next day? Yeah, so that is how the trends are happening. And uh, personally, I feel that it's a very welcome change. Uh, but from this welcome change, what I feel is that today, at this juncture where we are, I feel we are not, uh, we should have some revolution of sorts uh, within the food industry. There should be a revolution within the chefs. Uh, just like, you know, I, if I remember, I keep listening to a lot of songs uh, and I love music. So if you look at between Lakshmikant Parilal, R.D. Burman, you know, they each individual had a style. So today, chefs, we are not having individual style of our own. We are trying to ape the West. We are trying to see what is the other person doing and then we are trying to do something like that. So I feel as a chef, we should have uh, individual uh, approach towards the food. And we should each create our own speciality. I think the time has come now in India where um, restaurants will be known by chefs. It's slowly happening, but it's not yet there. You know, Abroad, most of the restaurants are known by the uh, chefs who run the place. Gordon Ramsay, Jamie Oliver, all these people, they have made it big. The name stands out. That's it. Uh, you take the best names in the industry and the name stands out. But in India, it's about uh, the brand, about the uh, restaurant. But it's not about the chef, what he wants to create. Right now, we are all consumer driven. If a customer wants to eat Indian food, okay, everybody is getting into Indian food. Suddenly, there was a big influx on um, eating uh, Northwest frontier food or a South Indian or a Mangalorean food. So everybody was trying to do that. But uh, it is not about what a chef wants to do. You know, uh, we, we as a chef, we try to, we, we learn a lot of things over a period of years. It's a skill, it's an art, and then we try to incorporate it in our menu, that this is what I want to do. But surprisingly, somebody will come and tell us, can you put chilies, can you, put, can you make it more spicy? But we don't try to understand that, okay, it's a taste, and can we develop the taste? I think because of that, Japanese food as such has not really uh, you know, taken its stand, because it has its own skill, it's the artistic part of it, but we still want to add some spice to it. Even though wasabi is there, but still we want to add spice to it. So I think the uh, trend which should now shift is uh, from a consumer-driven place to a chef-driven restaurant. And then people should come because I want to listen to R.D. Burman music or I want to listen to some rock music. So I want to listen, I want to eat what Chef Sabi is cooking or I want to eat what uh, the, okay, this uh, restaurant is known for its chef. So this is what I feel the trend should happen, but it's not happening there. It's slowly we are going towards that. Apart from that, I would like to talk also about uh, the way, uh, you know, 90s. I started my career in 90s, uh, started with Taj. Zodiac Grill, the epitome of, uh, you know, high, fine food, dining. And uh, there was one main kitchen where we were doing food for thousands of people. So both the uh, places were distinct. But what I did in 90s, I can tell you we started the Khausway counter in 90s, we started Thai food in 90s, we started uh, a lot of these uh, uh, medze platters in 90s, shawarma counter in 90s. You know, from 90s to 2000, uh, the trend was quickly changing. From 2000 to 2009, 
there was some kind of stability or I thought we were going, we are declining because we are not doing anything new. Then after 2009, if you consider to 2012, again there was a little bit of talking about going to comfort food, going talking about uh, regional food and then some uh, regional restaurants opened up. Along with that, from 2013 to 2015, things have changed really fast. Now today we see a lot of new influx of uh, the IT sector playing its role, the applications playing its role. But most of these places are uh, software driven. They are not brick and mortar places. So I, what I'm looking at is a really good restaurant, which we can say that it uh, portrays our cuisine. Till now, I think it's only the ITC uh, Dampuk, maybe uh, the Taj, and uh, the big, big hotels have these kind of restaurants where they can, where people can say, okay, this is the kind of cuisine I want to eat. But apart from that, the restaurants, what we are doing is, though there's a lot of scope in restaurants, people are eating out in restaurants more, but we are still doing that same pav bhaji, or we are trying to give it in a syringe, or we are trying to, uh, you know, just change the way it can be presented. Indian food is Indian food, you know, it has to be eaten with hands, it has to be served, it is a shared food. It's not like French where it can be plated. So if you are trying to aim the West, I think we should not try to overdo it or change the uh, soul of our Indian food. It's, a, it's about curry. I don't see Thai food really going like a French food, you know. They still serve the Thai curries, they still serve the Phat Thais the way it should be served. They don't try to do plating in the way the French uh, food is done. Uh, Indian food, the Asian food is not sophisticated food. It's food about harmony, enjoying, uh, eating with family. And French food is all sophisticated, but I think we should not change it. Any uh, yeah, input on that? Uh, do you agree to what I'm saying or I'm, I'm just, uh, are we on the same page? Okay, great. So this was one aspect what I felt uh, that, you know, how the trends happened between 90s to 2016. I've done around 20 plus restaurants so far. I am a consultant, but uh, I've done kinds of uh, QSR, you know, quick service restaurants. That is a new trend which is happening. QSRs are uh, coming up like every other corner. There they have a lot of scope to do, you know, be uh, speciality. If it is a, if it is, uh, if it is simple as vada pav, yeah, do a good vada pav. But again, in that we are trying to, uh, we are trying to copy the McDonald's, uh, or you know, I, I'm sorry if I can take the names, but we are trying to copy the Western fast food outlets. Now, everybody says that these outlets have got a very standardized recipe, but if you just eat their plain bread or a plain burger, believe me, they don't even add salt to it. So how can that be? Uh, how can, uh, so obviously it is standardized. But our food has a simple thing like vada, or a simple thing like misal, or a frank, uh, you know, uh, the kati roll. Everything is spice driven, and if you remove that spice and only add a ketchup to it, then you are not going to, uh, you are not going to like it. So when we try to do Indian food in a QSR format, uh, we fail miserably, fail uh, in that because what I like as a chef. You know, not necessarily a, a Sindhi gentleman will like it or a Gujarati lady will like it. Plus then there we keep talking about a lot of, uh, you know, uh, do's and don'ts. No, no, I don't want spicy. I don't want, I don't want this uh, to be oily. I don't want it to be uh, too, um, you know, fried. But when you, when you go to a, a international fast food, you don't see all that. So, you know, that's why our Indian QSRs don't, haven't succeeded yet far. Otherwise, we have the potential. You look at missile power. It has got a lot of potential to, you know, take it across the globe. But what, uh, what is good here may not be good in uh, Calcutta. Or what is good in Calcutta, our taste will not be uh, appreciated in South. People have tried to do the same thing with dosa, idli. But again, you know, individual taste in Pune, the dosa is served differently. In um, uh, within the uh, within the southern peninsula, also the dosa is served separately. So everybody has their own uh, remarks. So I feel we should appreciate that, and that's our positive side. That in India, the cuisine changes every 10 kilometers. Within each state, the cuisine changes. So we should appreciate that. We should build on the um, the kind of uh, you know the uh, uh, variety our cuisine has given. People talk about progressive Indian, but I feel the Indian cuisine has already been progressive. Look at the way it is balanced. Look at the way the food is designed. Look at the way each aspect of the uh, food which is served on a thali 
has significance to it. A pickle should not be eaten too much, so it's always given in small quantity. Rice, you can have it in two formats, a plain rice and a you know, pulao kind of a thing. If you look at a fried item, it's only a one papad or some kind of crisp which they offer uh, on an Indian thali. So I feel Indian food is already very progressive. All we need to do is just be authentic. As a chef, uh, if you see the catering colleges today, they don't know how to make a good paratha. They don't know how to make some good Indian regional dishes, but they know how to make pasta. So I'm not saying that it's bad, but I also want to uh, put emphasis that these colleges should try to uh, make the students uh, learn the speciality. You know, it can be as simple as uh, puran poli, but do we know how to make good puran poli as a chef? You know, believe me, in in my uh, college days, puran poli was like, how do we do it? But today, when I feel interested about it, you know, I learned it, and it's very easy to learn. All I uh, I feel that. As a cuisine, we should know the knack of food. It is about, okay, in Indonesia, they use peanuts, they use lemongrass, they use uh, sambal. So can I incorporate using those uh, spices or those tastes, including, uh, and believe in Asian, they use uh, things like snake goat, they use pumpkin, they use, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wild cucumber we call, we call it dodka here. They use all these vegetables, but somehow we have just neglected those vegetables and we have tried to copy zucchini. So this is where the changes should happen and uh, we should appreciate what is grown here. Lot of chefs are talking about sustainability today. They're talking about what is in the season, they're making menus as per seasonal uh, varieties, they're making menus, what is, uh, what is good for that place. So again, we are, you know, Indian food always, or Indian cuisine always had that um, trend in it. Any questions so far? Any questions? Yeah, please. Very nice to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. What sells most, concept, taste, or experience? Uh, good question. It's a, mix, it's a balance of all these three. Today, uh, everybody, uh, luckily, India has got a huge uh, market. It will be as simple as uh, somebody serving uh, Pani Puri, like a chart counter, to somebody serving a very fancy fine dining restaurant. So even if you're serving a chart, you can conceptualize it, you can give a good taste to it, and it should be hygienic, and at the same time, um, very economically priced or sensitively priced. India is a very sensitive market. Uh, even if you look at the top, bra top echelon of uh, the society, they are cost conscious. You know, they may spend maybe uh, 2,500 rupees a cover, uh, but not every day, or till somebody else is paying for it. So, India is a very price sensitive market. So all these three things actually build a, and earlier it was about location, but today I think location is also, uh, is not so important. You can make a small restaurant in some corner of Mahableshwar, and if it is popular, it becomes popular, people will throng to it. I've known, I've, I've heard of Asha Bosle going all the way to Mahableshwar to eat corn batters. So, you know, people are there, people will go to Kolhapur to eat a good tamla rasa. They will go to, uh, you know, they, uh, if, they, if, if I go to Calcutta, I would love to eat in the Chinatown there. So, uh, it's a balance of all these three things. I have another question. Yeah. As a mother, we have our woes. Uh, today you have your woes, okay. We have our woes. Okay. The children don't eat what, what is traditional, and they, they love to eat the pastas and the pizzas of the world. So, as a chef, what do you suggest? No, we haven't glamorized our food. We haven't made it. Uh, if, you, if you consider the ethos of our food, you know, uh, they have pastas, but I don't know if you have heard of a dish called dal dhokli, dal dhokli from Gujarat. If you make dal dhokli in, in the way Indian it is, it will resemble any kind of a, you know, uh, the flat pasta, tagliya tele. All right? So, we have everything with us. Somehow, it's all interconnected. It, it all started from somewhere. We have modaks, they have dim sums. You can make a lot of fillings in modaks. We have dosas, they have pancakes. Uh, even spring rolls, we have pabadams. Uh, you talk of um, the first, uh, you, you, people say that um, noodles are the you know, uh, starting point of pastas, but we already had vermicelli with us. You know, very thin, precise. I, I, if you actually see how they make vermicelli, it resembles the way the noodles are made. It is superb. I mean, I was zapped. You would see how the uh, ladies uh, in Konkan, they give shape to modaks. And we talk about dim sums and, uh, you know, rice flour. Uh, earlier, we were making dim sums with refined flour. Now we are using rice flour and that wheat at gluten. But if we make it with rice flour also, 
I think we'll be there. You know, we can have a very nice dim sum stuff with some wonderful uh, kheema, pao, uh, kheema masala into it. And uh, I don't want to call it modak. It will be very sensitive. But uh, it, it can be a wonderful part of dim sum. It's steamed. A uh, lot of our steamed dishes wrapped in banana leaves are uh, just out of the world. So actually, we haven't glamorized it. And yeah, because of uh, the names or you know, somebody calling it uh, Puri to somebody calling it Kasadia, um, OK, Kasadia. It will make a difference, but I think we should, we as uh, uh, you know, parents, we should try to uh, incorporate our Indian spices, Indian uh, availability, and make a kasadia of our sort. You know, children will like if they like if they like that very bad burger. <laughs> you know, just because of some gift, they can like our food. I'm sure of that. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Um, so a uh, uh, last point which I really want to uh, tap on before we go on to discussion is about hygiene. Uh, as, as again, as parents, I see you know people are eating outside. Now there's no harm in that. There are people they are making a living out of it, and uh, all it's food business. It's all about making a living. But when you see uh, you know the, the buses going around, the smoke coming out of it, and people are still eating food. So I wonder, are people aware about what they're doing? Is it really, uh, are we, I mean, uh, do we really don't bother as to, you know, how it can be consumed, how can we consume it? So obviously government has to put its uh, play its role to put the norms in place. It is their living, so I don't want to put a uh, hurdle on their living. But how can you do that? I mean, as a consumer, you talk about eating in the fanciest restaurants. I'm asking you all because you probably eat in, uh, you know, the best of the places also. So how can, okay, uh, so long as the food is prepared clean, hygienic, uh, there's no harm in it. But also be very clear about the hygiene aspect of it. And that, I think, only the consumer can drive it to a, to a large extent. Uh, as a chef, we always have learned, our grandmothers have taught us that the kitchen should be clean. But sometimes you should see uh, a very fancy restaurant, but you should ask them, can we see the kitchen? Because that is where you know the entire thing builds up. Uh, unfortunately, our places, I'm being a little controversial, like Michael, but uh, earlier the restaurants were all uh, owner-driven restaurants. So the lot of emphasis was put on the uh, interior of the restaurant. Okay, fancy places, marble, uh, Korean tabletops. But the kitchen was not planned. They didn't even have an exhaust system. Things are changing slowly. I, I've seen a lot of places now incorporating. It's becoming mandatory. But till the time we have a, you know, uh, some kind of audit uh, happening before we open a restaurant, uh, we should not be able to open a restaurant. Or we should not be able to sell something. You, if you have seen Far Eastern countries, I was really amazed. They have nice food parks. They have wonderful counters, each one having its own speciality. It's within a, uh, within a certain uh, place in, you know, uh, on the street. And it's buzzing with food. People don't cook at home there. So that everybody is coming there. The entire families are sitting there eating their daily food. But it's clean, you know. Even, even in a small place like Cambodia, that lady was wearing gloves. You know, there was no uh, filth around the place. There was no garbage created. A simple rule, clean as you go, is what we have been taught. But somehow people don't follow that. But there it was very possible. So you always felt like eating it. So once, once this is seen in, in uh, our cities like this, I think it will make a lot of difference. And then, you know, these regional food, the Bengali food, the Gujarati food, something like dal bati, will just become popular. You know, right now it's not popular across. But when people, all of us are going there and uh, trying out their uh, tawa machi, or uh, we are trying out uh, dim sums made in uh, the Chinatown, but in a nice vicinity, within uh, where hygiene is maintained, and not anywhere and anywhere, but in the right location, I think then the, these trends will start happening. And then you will also feel, OK, let's try and eat. You have eaten Italian yesterday. Let's try and eat Maharashtrian today. Good afternoon, Chef. Hi, good afternoon. Um, you mentioned QSR to me earlier. Yes. And uh, your chat was very insightful. We're entering QSR, but we're not from the restaurant business. And uh, uh, you spoke about cleanliness and hygiene as well. So that's one of the reasons we're getting into a very price conscious QSR format. But uh, I didn't understand the first part of the question. I said we're, we're not from the restaurant hospitality side and okay. we're entering QSR. Okay, you're entering We're creating a QSR, a QSR format. Okay. Uh, any tips for a startup? What we should be careful of? We're looking at a 300 square feet format. 
where it's very uh, price conscious. As yeah, such. Uh, I'll give you a small example before this. Uh, I did a, a project for a noodle person uh, just one year back. You see, you know, you, you have heard about the noodle controversy, what happened. And uh, actually, they were trying to make recipes out of it, you know, of that same brand. We made biryani, we made uh, smoothie, we made uh, uh, dim sums out of it, everything we made. Just they opened also, and after one month, the entire thing happened. And they had to close down, and now I think they will be revamping it again. But uh, for a QSR format, first and foremost, if, it's, if you're looking from a business perspective, commercial, completely commercial. Very much so. Then you should first make a complete project report as to how many uh, covers you want to do every day, how many meals you want to sell every day. I don't want to promote a set out. Sorry? I don't want to promote a set out format. I don't want people sitting in the, well, I don't want to promote a set out in the restaurant. I yeah. want it to be like a take correct, correct. Kind of format. So how many meals you want to sell every day? You know how many packets right. you should sell? Right. Okay. And it's a very simple rule. I've done it. If you have three dishes on the menu, okay, three or four dishes, uh, what kind of QSR you have in mind? So we're looking at Indian snacks coupled with uh, Indian beverages. So very traditional. Indian? Indian snacks coupled Indian with… Snacks. So let's yeah. say samosa, uh, yeah, correct? Something along those lines. Samosa, yeah. kachori and maybe uh, uh, wrap. Ankatai's wraps. And yeah. a wrap, okay? These three things. Now, uh, in your calculation, what you should do is, uh, in the competition, how much can you sell a samosa for? Okay, so put that amount, say 30 rupees, 40 rupees. How, uh, actually, 30 is still expensive from an Indian perspective for a samosa. But okay, because it's a QSR, you're branding it. We can say, uh, we, can, we can look at the other Western brands. So we can say, okay, a certain amount, say 40 rupees for samosa. For uh, kachori, we will put another 30, 40, 35 rupees. And a wrap, because you're steaming it or you're uh, putting it on tawa, we can say 60 rupees. Okay, so these three things. Now, in a day, if you say that even if you have to sell 100 of samosas, so put 100 there and do your multiplication on Excel. For each of the outlet, for each of the dish, I would do it for entire month. Okay, from starting from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Make a table. 1, 2, 3. On the first day of opening, how many you think you will? It's your assumption. Uh, you can anticipate how many right. you want to sell. To back up that, you can look at what kind of marketing you're doing. Okay, so uh, you know whether social media or are you going to put some pamphlets? Chef, besides the math and the marketing, any insider tips that you know only comes with experience like yours, that I'll take care of. The okay. math is done. So, uh, from what angle are you asking? Just experience, pure experience. Should My I experience for QSR, there's I a big pricing? market. There's a big market for uh, Indian company to grow into a uh, global uh, Indian fast food uh, outlet. Right. There's a big market for that. But we should not look at just 10 or 20. We have to look at thousands. Right. So uh, the picture is big. Right. But you cannot reach McDonald's or uh, Subways haven't reached in you know, one year. Right. They have taken their time. Luckily, today we have the infrastructure, we have the economics, everything in place. What they have probably done the mistakes, we can learn from the mistakes uh, what they've done. But still, I would say uh, we should go step by step. First, get your recipes right, get the taste right. And uh, your uh, budgets, very correct, right. to the point, you know, how much, what pricing it should be, right. and what food cost are you working on. Thank you so much, sir. All right, thank you. Anything else? So that was about food trends I felt. Uh, you know, uh, this is how things should change, and I think it will change uh, for the future. Let's have more chef-driven restaurants, and you are the ones who will uh, help us promote food uh, chef-based restaurants. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, Sabi and Michael, you know, do we have time for the discussion? Any questions if anybody, as in, the, I think the QSR was an interesting point. If there's anything else, Nilesh uh, spoke uh, about various things and all equally exciting. I love that Thank you. Modak and the Puranpoli part the most. And Thank like you. he said, Thank yeah, with so the Puranpoli. So, yeah, if uh, anybody uh, has any questions in the audience, uh, we can probably take a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Hello, everybody. Uh, I started from your fraternity and I'm a retailer now. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, that was a very good idea. But you know, whether people are uh, open to accept that, because in 1996, I created a Mediterranean restaurant in Calcutta. So it also had a side by side a Northwest Frontier Cuisine restaurant, which was awarded the best restaurant in India that year. But trust me, there was no taker. The, 
so finally it comes down to uh, Mughlai food and Chinese food which only works, you know. But, I mean, these kind, because see, very, so you are a chef. In a five-star hotel, you make good money. So if you're coming out and putting 14 hours, 15 hours, 16 hours a day, you would expect a little more money than what you're making as a salary. So even if you take IRR of 10 per, I mean, a net uh, um, profit of 10% of your sales, you need to have a sale of 2 to 3 lakhs a day, which is very, very difficult uh, to have your own restaurant and do it. And second is the sourcing part of it. You are talking about, I used to manage a company which also had a dairy business in Calcutta. It was, trust me, it was so difficult chasing farmers because they don't care whether children are having it or anybody's having it. To save electricity for leftover milk, they used to put caustic soda so that the milk is okay again next day, tomorrow they make fresh milk. So chasing these kind of farmers, just because, uh, you know, but ultimately when you make it into a branded product, you are responsible for the content. So I think how do you all plan to, or, or, or you were talking about, you know, say, <coughs> there are so many small, we were talking this morning about, say, idli, you know, like a Murugan idli or something. I mean, the same idli which is available for 60 rupees, do you think you make a racklet and, you know, put some hot cheese onto it and charge 1200 rupees and people would pay? I don't, a lot of people are doing it, but you know, so is, is that the way? I don't know. Uh, see, uh, in the beginning I said uh, trends in 96 and trend in 2016, 10 years, we have really grown. And uh, location, at that time aspect, you know, Calcutta, uh, even for that matter, in 2009 in Pune, things were different between the main mainstream Pune city uh, to uh, something outskirts of Pune city. So this, this is not only because of Calcutta or uh, a particular region, it is across the globe. If you see uh, a small, uh, if you see a small city in Italy, they will have the same problems about, uh, you know, uh, whom should we cater to? What kind of food we should cater to? Because uh, luckily at least we have the uh, population here, the market is there, but uh, abroad they, uh, they don't have such, such kind of population. What you said is true, you know, the farmers need to be really brought And aware. also, see, my, I, the college I don't want to name, uh, I come I, from, I come from, yeah. uh, what I notice is a lot of people who didn't even uh, touch hospitality industry were teachers. So you can't, it's government initiative has to be there to train them to so that they give proper education to us. You know, we learned it once we joined the industry. Uh, that's my my revelation. Uh, lucky, uh, I, I mean, I will not uh, see. I, I think I, I'm seeing it from a more open uh, aspect that everybody should be. In fact, uh, the revolution will happen only because a lot of people are entering into it. Earlier, as chefs or from a hospitality background, we were only looking from a certain point of view. My objective was to work in the five-star hotel and afterwards, uh, you know, become a corporate chef. But by the time I became corporate chef, things changing was things were changing so fast and rapidly and uh, you know a lot of food was happening so i decided let me see a lot of people are coming into this business they need the backup of the kitchen uh, support they need the backup of the menu they don't know they can make a good restaurant design but what about the uh, menu aspect of it so that's where i decided to venture on my own and i made this uh, company uh, uh, to which where, where i can take consulting business uh, projects so this is this is a uh, ongoing process it will change uh, you cannot stop it i may have done uh, I may have spent 15 years, 20 years in the hospitality industry today, but when I see people who are not from the industry are still making money, and they're making uh, loads of money than what I would earn as a corporate chef, I would uh, wonder that, you know, what have I done? My, my objective, my goal was to become corporate chef of five star hotel, handling all the different restaurants, cuisines, working in the best possible manner. But when you see a restaurant, uh, you know, may being successful and without following any of the trends, uh, what we have learned, you know, where are we in, in that case? Then I cannot stop at that angle. I have to uh, improvise myself and I have to see what is happening in the society and how I can put my um, contribution to it. So I realized that in this experience, I realized that what you need to do is uh, you, need, you don't need to unnecessarily buy things from abroad or you don't need to buy uh, imported products, even if it is in Calcutta or in small place like Nagpur or in Kolhapur, but be uh, adept to the local taste and uh, um, your menu can be 20% experimental where you can try to give your own dishes into it. But best of luck, I think I've tried that because you know in our time there was a chef called uh, Remo Blanc, the manager of the Cassins in uh, London. 
a four seasonal menu, one year waiting time. You know, he started long time back, we, we are following now. But uh, experimental menu, I have my doubt because a restaurant… No, just 20%. Huh? But even if just it 20 is… 20%, which you feel that you should add it to the menu because you like it. High street retail, paying rent, paying staff salary, getting your own salary. Uh, survival is a question, I think, uh, still. Unless it's again, a Mughlai Chinese. Again, I have seen examples, you know, uh, most of the time the proprietors, they don't follow the rules. No, I They don't follow the agree, uh, agree. government sanctions. They open the restaurant. And then, you know, they keep paying uh, out of the box money. And then they say, we don't have business. Or they are not putting proper co control methods in the way they select a manager. Most of the places today, the restaurants have come up is that they have money, they are HNIs, and they don't want to sit on the business. You see MS Oberoi, you see Ajit Kerkar, they were in the business. The business was in the blood. You, you name the top guys, you know, they knew what was the business all about. It's a hospitality business, hotel business is a completely different take than, uh, that is what I feel, that than uh, opening up a, or I think any business is like that. You need to be into that, at least for first two, three years, till the time you are setting up the ground rules, or the culture, or the DNA of the place. So if you are not going to take care of uh, who the manager is, and how the controls are, a lot of these people don't know how to operate the material management system. Okay, and that's where the siphoning happens or, you know, if you're not controlling the quality of the goods received, you will have, you will not, a lot of chefs say, or even I believe in that, that if your quality of food is great, the food is very good. Okay, but if you don't look after the quality or some compromise happens because of some issues, you can uh, look at, uh, you know, uh, degrading yourself. So. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, Savi, you want to, uh, you have been a restaurateur and you, you have opened fancy restaurants. So do you have anything, any take on this? Let's try to, uh, I think his grievances, what a lot of people will have the same grievance. Um, is, uh, I don't know if there's a particular, uh, sir, you're a very, very experienced person and a chef yourself. So I don't know if there is a particular uh, solution to this, what you're saying. It's of course a socio-economic scenario. It's also uh, a lot to do with uh, how real estate are, you know, shaping up in this country. So the multiple factors into this, I don't think it is a food uh, story or I don't think the answer lies in the food. Of course, Nilesh tried to, uh, you know, point the, the basic factors very well, which is hygiene, cost, uh, manpower, uh, location, uh, um, metro cities to B cities. So the perspective is very clear. I think over the discussion, whatever uh, we try to speak, all three of us, myself, Michael, and uh, Chef Nilesh, uh, that we are uh, pretty much talking about what we have seen. I think collectively, uh, between three of us, we have about 20, 20, 20, about 60 odd years in the industry. Whatever we are seeing, we're trying to put it out in a platter, hoping that it will help uh, everybody in the forum. Uh, and yes, there is a lot that is going on. Also, what uh, I noticed that uh, Nilesh was saying that there's a lot of people who are not from the industry are doing exceedingly well. So yes, uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, time to be in the industry for us and also for everybody else that there is so much opportunity. There is a, um, to do new things, to try new concepts, to uh, do something experimental that gentleman there spoke about uh, the QSR that and I assume that you are not from the food industry, right? Yeah, so there are uh, 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 It's an open gate space today. You can get in and uh, create your mark and leave your mark and also earn so it's a fantastic time to be in India uh, considering there are one point uh, you know uh, 1.4 uh, billion stomachs to feed or to be fed uh, so, yeah, uh, having said that, I think we're pretty much out of our time. If anybody has one last question, uh, okay, ma'am, go for it. Good afternoon to all chefs. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so my question is addressed to anyone. I mean, anyone can answer it. Michael will answer it for you. Okay. Um, so, uh, what I would like to know is, uh, what are uh, the most, uh, like you talked about uh, the journey of trends over the last 20, 25 years or so. So, um, what are the most growing international cuisines in India? Let's say if we were to say from 2015 to 2025, uh, which would, will be the most trendy international cuisines, uh, popular cuisines in India, uh, based upon your experience and the current trends? Uh, I also have another question. Uh, you also, uh, Chef Limai, talked about the um, going regional and going local. 
which we see is happening in many places, which cuisines, regional and local, do you see uh, becoming very popular um, again in the next 10 years or so, and why? Um, also, from the point of youngsters and kids, what are the different food trends that, that you predict that, that is going to happen in India over the next five, 10 years? Because food trends take some time to build up. So that is why I said five to 10 years. Okay, the ball's in my court. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, change happening. We are going the way of South American cuisine is happening a lot by way of Mexican. Uh, Peruvian a little bit, Spanish is there. Um, and people are moving beyond Thai cuisine now. They're going into uh, Cambodia and Southeast Asian food. Uh, the Northeast cuisine, which is part of India, it is a very much part of India, it is becoming big. They've got vegetables which I have not heard of. Even when I was in Cal, I was seeing vegetables which they said was from the Northeast. And I said it's not even available in the rest of the country. Um, so the Northeast, the Far East, these are cuisines to look out for. Uh, for kids, I'll go one step backwards. Um, I'll take, for instance, the plain simple samosa. And somebody was telling me, I'm making a deconstructed samosa. And I looked at the person and I said, do you even know the history behind a samosa? We've got to glamorize our own cuisine to make it a global, I won't say global cuisine, to make it up there. For people to want our Indian cuisine, You've got to glamorize it. You've got to talk about the history of the food. We can talk about pasta, which children love. Why do they love pasta? Because the Italian chefs have glamorized the pasta. They glamorize chefs working in a kitchen, playing with the dough, billowing flour going all over the kitchen. But that is not what it is about. It's about glamorizing our mother going beyond glamorizing our mothers, because my mom never taught me to cook. It was my maid who taught me to cook. So I can say, yes, she was earthy in her cooking. And you know the way she put the spices, very rural, rustic, Maharashtrian cuisine. And she glamorized it for me. She, the first thing I remember learning was to make a kulfi. I'd probably be about the age of 10 or 12. And you know the reduction of the milk and all. Stirring it for hours on end, and whilst you're stirring it, your mind is running a wild imagination at the age of 12. And this is what kids need to learn today. And once you do this with our kids, we do glamorize the next food trend. It's us creating the next food trend. I think it's uh, almost over. So. Thank you all, and uh, fantastic uh, sharing the dice with both of you. And uh, thank you for a uh, very patient listening. I think we are over with our time, so we're going to uh, make way for the next uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, and a huge round of applause to Chef Sabi Sachigurai, Chef Michael Swami, and Chef Nilesh Limai. Thank you so much.